This is going to cover the advanced airway. So we kind of broke this stuff up. When we, when we looked at recreating the course, what we found is we had a lot of students who were kind of struggling in the airway ventilator section. That's why we hit the ABG so hard. Um, on the actual FPC exam, or, or even in the CCPC, they don't really go that far into the weeds as far as the pH. But clinically, okay, like I said, this course is a blend between exam prep and actual real life clinical knowledge. In real life clinical practice, anytime you guys transport anybody that's on a mechanical ventilator, you're gonna be using these associations and these relationships because that is how we tune and treat our patients now. Just like we don't slam bicarb anymore, we use the ventilator. This is why we intubate people prophylactically just because as that respiratory fatigue sets in, they're no longer able to keep that up. So that partially compensatory mechanism turns into fully uncompensated, which if you keep letting it go, what does it turn into? a mixed gas. Everybody eventually gets on the same side of the fence when they stop breathing. And then what do we do? You know, we start pumping on their chest. Okay, well, the first thing we do is start ventilating. So we talk and we take over that compensatory mechanism through the BVM and then hopefully we NRSI them or innovate them and then we can uh, move them over to the ventilator and use that to now kind of treat the patient. So, you know, if you think about it, everybody eventually dies in a mixed gas imbalance. Okay, we're trying to stave that off and the number one way we can do that and the easiest way is using res the respiratory system, uh, center. So using, you know, tube, good ventilation and good oxygenation. So making sure you got good seals, using the appropriate tube size and then always look at your vent settings afterwards. If you're not trending the right direction, go back and look at what are my vent settings doing? Because probably something in there is off and we can look at that. So hopefully uh, Andy will definitely cover that. In this section, we're just going to talk about a little bit about advanced airway kind of maneuvers, uh, some difficult airway kind of ideas. And we're going to go a little bit into uh, just the why behind everything, and then we'll go over RSI pharmacology. And I don't like calling it RSI first off, so let me just put it, put it there. This is something that you really need to kind of practice with. So I'm going to start this lecture out with saying every shift that I work, the first day I will do, I will practice a full innovation on either adult, pediatric, or neo scenario. And I do that, and we have bags in our uh, facility that are set up just like the bags in the aircraft. So you get muscle memory. The reason why I do that, if you look at the uh, walls in a seizure journal, they say, hey, uh, someone who does innovations, they should be hitting at least 15 to 1600 per year to be considered a proficient innovator. Man, I get like, Maybe 10, 12, you know, with BiPAP and high flow nasal cannula, it's going down even more because we're able to use other tools and adjuncts to just kind of stave off that innovation. So what can we do to stay at the top of our game? Training, practice. Okay, you guys got plenty of time, hopefully on shift, that you guys can, hey, you grab a head, grab your partner, grab some gear, and do a scenario. Don't just like, hey, I'm not going to try. That doesn't help you. Okay, you got to get muscle memory in that knowledge base in. Practice with your RSI drills. You know, we would have a whiteboard outside. <laughs> No crap, the, the bathroom, crap, bathroom. Um, so we leave it out the bathroom and we would write down the patient's weight and then my partner would walk by and then they would fill out, hey, what are you gonna use for your, your ketamine? What are you gonna use for your predose? What are you gonna use for your bolus? What Ben settings are you gonna use? And we just do that all day long. It's not, it doesn't take much, but think about now if I catch a call right now and I go out on a flight, how much more am I ahead in my game versus waiting to get spun up? You know, I, I hate the first flight of the, of the shift because it's like I gotta brush off the cobwebs a little bit and kind of get back into my rhythm. So if I can stay at the top of my game and my rhythm, okay, I don't have that lag time and you're always staying on top. You're getting the drug dosages down. You're getting the muscle memory of pulling drugs up. Because I've seen a lot of people grab a 10 cc uh, syringe and try to pull up a Tominate. What does that do? You get half the dose. And then you gotta go find another 10 cc syringe, right? Or use a 20. They, don't, they haven't learned that yet. Okay, so that's one of those things. If you play with this stuff, you get used to it. Okay, it instills muscle memory. So when it comes time and there's a lot going on, you can grow, uh, go back and fall back on your training, okay? And you'll know where to grab stuff. So the last thing I hate to doing is ripping off my bag and it's a yard sale on the scene, right? So, yeah, right? And, we, and we've all been there, right? We, that was one of the things early on as a firefighter. I hated because I'd be in the back of the box going, I know I checked this thing off in the morning, but I'm like opening up every cabinet to find one little thing. So, you know, I highly encourage, you know, daily checks, be, you know, be on top of this. You guys are going to mean the A game, okay? Can't be complacent. You guys got to put in the time. That's what makes the difference of everybody. So. I highly, highly, highly encourage, go back to your facilities and practice this stuff on a daily routine basis. It becomes more of a habit. You start seeing more pHs, you start seeing more lab values, and things really start clicking, and your clinical knowledge goes to a whole different level. And once you start understanding that stuff, it'll start opening up more avenues for you. So it all goes back to, what are you doing while you're on duty? So utilize that time to help benefit yourself and improve yourself as a clinician. Okay, so you guys are gonna start seeing up here at the top, um, those of you guys at home and online too, you're going to start seeing on top, you're going to see FPC in red, okay? That's the number of questions in this section that you might anticipate to run in on your exam. 
The CCPC, you got 30 out of this next two uh, lectures that you're going to run into that will be on your exam. And then for the CFRNs, everything's 31 or 44. So, um, but you, they do draw a lot of ventilator questions. And the ventilator questions seem to get a lot of people. So, you know, we do have the ice simulate here. Um, later during lunch, we'll have it out so you guys can practice using the different kind of ventilators and getting some of that knobology down. You know, we'll have it available the rest of the course. So, catch us a break so we can kind of help that. Uh, help instill some of that stuff. We have videos that we're implanting into the, the vent lecture now, so you guys can see both me and Annie kind of jaw jacking in the back of a rig. Um, but hopefully it brings up a little bit more of a clinical understanding of what's going on. Okay, and then once again, this is to give you guys the fundamental knowledge. So I highly encourage taking that knowledge and going back to where you're at. Hey, do a round in the ICU. You know, there's a lot of times where I couldn't get, how do I maintain this critical care training? You know, especially when I was new on, you got to do the time. I'd go out to the U of A and I'd ask, hey, can I sit around for grand rounds? Can I just sit in the ICU and learn from the RT and ask questions? I'd go sit in OB and learn from, hey, why do you guys use this versus this? Why do you guys choose that versus that? Why? You know, and that helped me as a provider. But you got to get off your loins and go do it. Okay, you got to go call. You got to get off. You, we don't get the information very easily in the training anymore. So we have to go out. You guys are doing it right now by being here. You guys are going out to try to improve yourself. So those are always good options. Go to your local hospital, your local uh, uh, med director. See if you can sit in on some of the training. The ho big hospitals always have training going on. So, Okay, so innovation. Why do we fail? I love this from Rich Levitan. Okay, so why do we fail? Has anybody here taken an advanced airway course or difficult airway course or anything like that? Yeah. Okay, I'll lead a little story. The reason why I took my first difficult airway course with Levitan at AMTC back in Sacramento in 2008 was because I had done a crike. It did not go the way I had planned. It did not look like that pretty Scott Weingard YouTube video. I'm sorry. It was a total mess. I didn't pull the trigger soon enough. I didn't want to do that procedure because think about medic school. What's the first thing that you ever, when you start talking about crike, what does your instructor say? It's bloody. It's intimidating. So I'm getting set up from the start to be intimidated by this procedure and being scared of it. And I'll tell you, I was there. I was that guy. I was that guy that did, did everything I could not to crike. And then I finally pulled the trigger on it. Would it have made the difference in that patient? Probably not. Okay? But I learned from that that my clinical confidence really took a shot. And I had a really deep down question myself, do I still want to be a paramedic? Because I was like, man, I could have done better. I knew I could have done better. So that's why I went out and challenged myself to take a difficult course so I could get that clinical knowledge and confidence back and get armed with the tools. And then I find out it's not that scary. It's not that intimidating if you have practiced it. So once again, practice, go out and get the knowledge if you need it. So, but failure to maintain the air, uh, manage the airway is a major cause of preventable death in pre hospital settings. We know this because we see the studies come out. We're getting worse at this because guess what? We're doing less innovations, less live innovations coming out of school. You know? So utilizing what we can, like uh, we got Carl Stortz here with their innovation mannequins, practice. If you have the ability to practice, use them. Why do you think we fail in a pre hospital setting? What do you guys think? You guys at home, talk to Andy. What do you guys think? Why do we fail? Why are our failure rates going up? We're not doing enough. The way we were taught. The way we were taught. Okay, so the way we were taught, we were taught to kind of be set up for failure from the start because we're so scared of this thing. So get that clinical confidence and step over that mind barrier. Training and education, training goes back. You guys, we can practice on duty. We, there's, there's plenty of YouTube videos out there that you guys can figure out how to make little crike trainers. 3D trainers right now are like 10 bucks a pop. Like you can use these tools to really improve your skills and get that muscle memory down and not be so intimidated by the procedure. So hopefully I'll talk about some of these things as we go through it. I'll give you some of the clinical pearls that I have. And this is stuff that I've learned from my mentors throughout my career. I want to pass it on to you. If you guys got some good tips or tricks, please share them so we can all learn from each other. Okay, so understand the importance of preparation and planning. I would say that this is probably the biggest part of all of this. Preparation and planning. Training, education, being prepared to do the job, having your equipment set up, having the right kind of equipment and the tools to do the job. How many here use a bougie every time you innovate? Okay, once again, if you go statistically, if you use a bougie versus a non-bougie, your innovation rates are going to be higher. Who uses VL now with their bougie? Okay, maybe a couple. Okay, now you're statistically even going to be even higher. So use these tools that are available to you if you have them available. I understand that some of them, you guys just don't have that ability or that, that uh, but this is where we kind of instill that kind of confidence and you guys go back and make your medical directors really mad and go, hey, why don't we do this? <laughs> why are we doing it wrong? Because you guys are challenging the system. It's not bad to say, hey, why shouldn't we be doing it the right way? Evidence-based medicine is out there. You can't lie with statistics or numbers or research. It's there for a reason. So um, try to use some of that things. Early detection of airway problems, okay? 
recognizing the problems and seeing that train coming is one thing. So that's where clinical experience comes in because you go, hey, had kind of a patient similar to this. Last time, this patient crumped on me, just went totally downhill. Once they go into respiratory fatigue, okay, that should be a trigger in the back of your mind to start thinking, hey, I either need to turn this way or I gotta get ready for this way because it's coming, are you prepared for it, okay? Rapid and effective inter uh, intervention. I have a really simple plan of A, B, C, D when it comes to airway. A is airway, okay? I'm gonna oxygenate and ventilate any way I can, whether it be positioning, BBM, dual MPA, OPA, However, I'm just trying to get oxygen on board because we show that, hey, the sooner we get oxygenation and ventilation established, the more likely we're gonna be successful, okay? So we don't start going down the innovation route, I just try to get the airway. I just wanna get air to go in and out, okay? After that, it's plan B. So if A doesn't work, I go to plan B, okay? So B stands for my backup airway. So for me, the backup airway, um, we use the eye gel. I love the eye gel, okay? I can use it as a tube exchanger. I don't always just innovate my patients. Some of our aircraft in the 407, the patient's head's right here to the side of me. I can't. It used to be take your seatbelt off, do this kind of sideways kind of thing, maybe get the tube and, you know, it's not going to help your game. So now it's like, hey, I'll just open it up with my laryngoscope, put it in an eye gel, put a bougie in, take the eye gel out, push my slide. I use it as a tube exchanger, right? So outside the box thinking, right? The other thing is, is B doesn't work and I go to C, right? So I'm not oxygenating, not ventilating. My backup plan, my SGA didn't work. Then I go to C. C is cripe, okay? Move to the cripe. If you can pull that trigger sooner and recognize that those trigger points in your own professional clinical practice, you'll be able to pull that trigger a lot sooner, okay? And if cripe doesn't work, you move to plan D and they're dead, okay? But you tried everything, right? So I did A, B, C, D. And it's how we move through that that really dictates our patient care. Like I said, the first time I ever did a cryic, it took me a long time to get from A to C. And I know that, okay, and I've learned from that. And that's where clinical training, going to take a, you know, outside classes have really kind of helped me with my clinical knowledge and my game. Okay, failure to maintain adequate oxygenation, we understand that. We can't get through that. Is this a hypoxic respiratory problem? Do I have problems getting O2 in? Or is this a CO2 problem? I have a problem getting in tidal out, okay? So is this an expiratory problem or an inspiratory problem? Because that's gonna change the way we treat this patient, right? We know that if it's a hypoxic patient, I probably wanna give more FiO2 and PEEP to drive that with my partial pressures. If not, if it's a CO2 problem, what I need? More time to breathe out. More time to get the CO2. If they can get O2 in, they just can't get the CO2 back out. So give them more time. So longer E times, making sure I'm maximizing my tidal volumes in my P plat. So that's especially important. So making sure you have good ventilator settings. So continual reassessment, okay? Always going back to, am I doing the right thing? Are my vent settings getting better? Is my patient picking up a spontaneous rate? Did I drop below my patient's spontaneous rate or where they should be at? Those are all things to think about because if we don't do good ventilator settings, hey, great, we did great on A. Did B, got the airway, great, but then downstream we don't do anything else and we actually further that patient's you know, uh, metabolic disturbance or whatever might be going on. And then have a backup plan, okay? So my backup plan is my, my, uh, my eye gel. And if my eye gel don't work, we go straight in. It's whoever's calling crike. So if I'm in there innovating, I say, crike, whoever's giving the drugs now is the crike person. I pull out and I now assist them. And they can say crike too. You know, and it's like, hey, if they say correct, then it stop everything because they have the perspective. They're, they're looking at, I'm, I'm kind of focused in on getting this airway set up and established. They're looking at the whole plan. So they give the drugs and they're kind of stepping back. And so that's kind of the way you guys need to approach it as a partner, okay? Me, part of my assessment early on, I will mark the cricothyroid membrane with the Sharpie as part of my airway assessment. Why? One, it scares everybody because they're like, oh, you're going to crack this guy? I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> But that is the end goal, right? Like if I, this all doesn't work, this is next. And it kind of helps me with my, my mental, find a mental block and go, hey, I identify it early on. I know right where, to, or my partner knows right where to go. If we, if things go south, you know, if the brown stuff hits the fan, great. I know exactly where I need to go to hit that mark, okay? And if that doesn't work, well, I've tried everything. It also helps with that mental, hey, this isn't working. I already made my mark. I know where I need to, that's what I need to go to. So it, for me, it's like a little hint, a little like, a uh, little pencil, a little seed. Okay, so we get devastating injuries to patients and families. Okay, I've seen multi, multi-million dollar lawsuits come out of this. I've seen providers lose their job from this. Okay, so this is something that, and think, you think the company, no offense to the companies, but do you think they have your best interest sometimes? Not always, okay, it depends on where you're at. But at the end of the day, who's ultimately responsible for that failed airway? You as a clinician, okay? So you, doesn't, regardless of what training you got, okay, you as a clinician are ultimately responsible for that patient, so own it. Own yourself and understand that, hey, this is where I need to be. Mental burden on staff. Okay, I will tell you that first crack I did totally got in my head, totally minded me. And the reason why I did is because it shot my clinical confidence. I didn't even think I should be a practicing paramedic anymore after that because I thought I killed the guy. Okay, that's something you got to live with. Okay, 
So once again, learn from our mistakes. Try not to repeat them. Okay? Settlements, yeah, they get really expensive. So Lindsay kind of alluded to some of this stuff already. You're seeing these come up again, right? You're seeing these blood gases coming, the critical uh, indication, indicators for uh, intubation, those ABGs. So those are very important because textbook, yes, but put them with your patient and what's going on. If they're at like a CO2 of 55, I notice that the rate's still falling off and they're respiratorily fatigued, okay? I use that in my clinical patient, and that's, that's seeing the train coming. I see that sucker coming, I'm gonna start getting set up for that so I can meet him halfway and hopefully he doesn't take out my patient, so. Okay, protection of the airway. Okay, they can't manage their airway. Okay, GCS less than eight, let's innovate. That's still something that's held on the exam. It's still something we commonly talk about in practice today. But once again, I go back to what is the patient's clinical condition. If their GCS is eight because they're not being oxygenated, well, maybe if I give them some high flow nasal cannula or increase their BVM with some PEEP, maybe I fix the oxygenation problem and that fixes the GCS of eight and I don't really need to innovate them. Because we know what happens when we innovate our patients. What statistically will happen if you innovate someone? What's gonna happen to the mortality rate? It goes up. Yeah, it increases just by getting in a tube. And then, for example, I innovate someone, I was an older lady, she ran out quite frequently, she would exacerbate her COPD. So we innovate her just for her COPD because she was respiratorily fatigued. Yeah, that was exactly what happened. So we transported her in. This is when I was working fire on the ground. They flew her into Tucson. I did up doing an inner facility in Tucson later. Wanted to check in on her three days later and she had died of sepsis. So once again, they get ventilator acquired. She probably had something else going on, but just because they have that tube, your increase in mortality goes up. So I actually try to stave that off. You know, if I can use another adjunct, high flow nasal cannula, passive oxygenation, whatever I can to try to help prevent that, I do it. But I do that in conjunction with knowing that my end goal is probably gonna be an innovation or a crike if need be. So it's all about, hey, does, if this is working, then great. If it doesn't work, it's not like it's gonna hold me up on my train of thought or my treatment plan, so. Positive pressure, insufficient ventilatory effort. That goes back to that respiratory. They start dropping their respiratory rate. They get tired. They've been breathing. Like, think about the DKA patient. Why do we get called on DKA patient? Do they know they have sugar, especially if it's new? Usually not, right? We get called because it's a respiratory distress patient. Why is it respiratory? Because they've been breathing at 32 for the last three days. And eventually they get tired and they come down. Then that really starts sliding the acid base imbalance. So pulmonary toilet, think about people with pneumonia, ARDS, okay? There's a barrier in the way, okay? When we talk about, you know, getting the partial pressure and getting that O2 molecule through that interstitial space and getting it back across so it can load up in the plasma and then onto the hemoglobin, what's in the way of that? Normally we have what? Surfactant, right? Surfactant is very permeable, it's very thin. It allows gas to move in and out really quickly. But if I start throwing mucus or maybe I have CHF and I'm starting to back up all that plasma and fluid into the interstitial space, well now I got a bigger barrier and it takes longer for that O2 molecule to walk across to the other side. So I gotta look at that. Do I need to give them more time to inspire? Patient progression, okay? Once again, going back to that, either that DKA patient or hey, maybe it's a trauma patient that are continuing to bleed out internally or externally and we start losing the ability to get O2 down to the cells and perfuse the brain, we see that coming, okay? So we get prepared for that. Okay, as far as pediatrics, okay? We like the pediatric assessment triangle. This is something that's taught in PEP, if anybody's taken a PEP course. I like PEP, it's more indicative of what we actually do in the field compared to PALS, in my personal opinion, okay? But I like it because it's down and dirty. We'll come back again in, in pediatrics again. But you have appearance, worker breathing, and circulation, okay? And it's very you know, easy to walk in and go, are they sick or are they not sick? Okay, I look at that, look at their appearance. I mean, if anybody's had a sick kid, okay, with your parents out there, you know when your kid's sick. If I look at mom and mom's freaked out, that kind of causes me to kind of like, okay, mom's freaking out. Okay, this isn't normal for a kid. And I use that in my clinical decision making. How's the kid? Is he watching you track as you walk in the room? I mean, when I was wearing my bunker gear and I, you know, I'm this big guy, I'd walk in the room, I would expect that kid to be terrified of me. And so if he's not, then I go, why? You know, or if he, I walk across the room and walk in, I just see him, he's not tracking me, he's just somnolence or he's out of it, then I start asking myself why. What's his skin condition? Is he tenting? What's my, uh, where, what are my fontanelles doing? Are they sunken or are they raised? You know, wh what's going on? I see a lot of patients that go, or a lot of uh, clinical providers that go in and do assessments on peds. What do you think they don't do? Lift up the clothes or the onesie. Okay? They don't look underneath. You got a sick kid, you want to see if they're using their intercostal retractions. You want to see if they're doing tracheal tugging because that all leads into, hey, if they're using their intercostal muscles, that means they got nothing left. They're using the last ditch muscles that keep them alive. And if that goes, when they get tired eventually, 
Now you're not moving gas anymore. So once again, looking at where that train's coming. Am I frozen online? All right, stand by guys. I'll try to get this back up and going. It's always technology, right? It's still trying to join. I wonder if it kicked me off and it's not letting me back in. If I could ask if you guys are on the Wi-Fi, if you guys could jump off just because the bandwidth is really narrow here. You're back in? It's on, but I think because uh, they're seeing us being frozen. There we go, we're back. All right, checking in online. Can you guys get us back? Sorry we lost you there for a minute. We had technical difficulties. Good to go. Okay. So in this video I'm going to show you guys right now, what I want you guys to think in the back of your head is what are some of those clinical signs we just discussed about the PAT? You guys see the tracheal tug in these pulling? Substernal retractions. What does LLC? Not really there. You saw the intercostal retractions. So, I mean, would that be a sick or not sick for you? Yeah. Very sick. Yeah. So, so what are you starting to think about clinically already? I'm probably going to have to manage that airway. How am I going to manage that airway? So, once again, like going back to the start of this lecture, training. If you're doing those RSI drills back at home or back at the base or at the station, okay, you get more clinically proficient. And so when you see this, you're not so scared about it and you're quicker to act and go down that, that ABC route.